Hi, everybody. I think we'll just get started and folks might trickle in as we go. Um, I want to welcome you to the Memory Dishes Commencement Forum. This forum is organized in conjunction with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice's gallery exhibition, Memory Dishes, Women in African Diasporic Cooking, which just opened yesterday and is now on view just across the street in the Yellow House. Um, we encourage you to go check it out after the forum and enjoy the Center's open house this afternoon. Uh, my name is Johanna Obenda, and I am a master's student here in the public humanities, as well as a graduate fellow at the CSSJ. Um, and with the support of the faculty from the CSSJ, this past year, um, I've been curating the exhibition Memory Dishes. Uh, Memory Dishes explores cooking practices of the African diaspora through the oral histories of six local families of African descent, so families here in Providence. I'll just show you them. Shout out to the families. Uh, these families trace their roots from all over the world. Um, some are from the Rhode Island area, some from the American South, the Caribbean, and Cape Verde. The exhibit explores the ways cooking knowledges are shared intergenerationally through memory and the ways that traditions, past and present, are reimagined through migration and across time. Uh, through their oral histories, the families of memory dishes really examine themes of labor, celebration, survival, community, identity, um, and migration. So today we are really excited to discuss these themes as related to African American and African diasporic cooking with Dr. Jessica B. Harris and Ms. Tony Tipton Martin. Um, so both Dr. Harris and Ms. Tipton Martin will give a brief in, uh, overview of their work, kind of show you what their worlds are like, and then I'll have a few questions for them. And then we'll really just open it up to audience Q&A. So it'll be less of a lecture, more of a conversation. So I will introduce the panelists. Right. Tony Tipton Martin is a culinary journalist, author, and community activist who has dedicated her career to building a healthier community. She's the author of The Jemima Code, Two Centuries of African American Cookbooks, a book that celebrates the important legacy of African American cooks and their cookbooks. She's the winner of a 2016 James Beard Book Award, the 2016 Art of Eating Prize, and the recipient of a 2015 Certificate of Outstanding Contribution to Publishing from the Black Caucus of the Library Association. Her upcoming book will be published by Clarkson Potter this winter, entitled Jubilee, Recipes from Two Centuries of African American Cooking. It features 100 dishes from the African American cookbooks in her collection. Tony was the first African American food editor of a da major daily newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, the nutrition writer for the Los Angeles Times, and a contributing editor to Heart and Soul magazine. And she has been a featured speaker at book festivals, libraries, museums, universities, and multiple food organizations. She's profiled in the 35th annual 2016 Aetna African American History Calendar, is a member of the James Beard Award Committee, and is a co-founder and former president of both the Southern Foodways Alliance and Foodways Texas. She's an advisor to a grassroots peace movement that is rekindling the pie social as a vehicle for racial tolerance and a member of the advisory board for the Old Ways African Heritage Diet Pyramid. Thank you for being here. And Jessica B. Harris is an award-winning food historian and one of the world's leading experts on the African diaspora cooking. She is the author of the memoir, My Soul Looks Back, Simon and Schuster, 2017, a finalist for the Penn Open Book Award about her days in Harlem in the 70s, where her social circle included <laughs> James Baldwin, Toni Morrison, Maya Angelou, Nina Simone, and other leading black intellectuals and artists of the time. She is the author of 12 critically acclaimed cookbooks documenting the food and foodways of the African diaspora as well, including Iron Pots and Wooden Spoons, Africa's Gifts to the New World Cooking, Sky Juice and Flying Fish, Traditional Caribbean Cooking, The Welcome Table, African American Heritage Cooking, The Africa Cookbook, Taste of a Continent, and Beyond Gumbo, Creole Fusion Food from the Atlantic Rim. Harris also conceptualized and organized the Black Family Reunion Cookbook. Her book, High on the Hog, A Culinary Journey from, Ameri from Africa to America, was the International Association for Culinary Professionals 2012 prize winner of, for culinary history. She also conceptualized and curated the James Beard 
um, nominated Sweet Home Cafe at the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. She has received an honorary doctorate from Johnson and Wales, and her body of work was recently inducted into the James Beard Cookbook Hall of Fame. So we're happy to have you both. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for being here uh, on this exciting um, occasion, a great weekend for graduates and their families. And I also want to thank Johanna and all of the faculty, Dr. Bogues and other, and Cynthia. Catherine uh, at the center for this invitation. Um, it's really an exciting opportunity for me to be able to partner the work that I have spent so much time dedicated to um, with with the next generation that is conceptualizing that work and taking it to the next level. So it's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I also want to let you know that I left my iPad at home, so this is my first experience with uh, uh, using the cell phone as a speech prompter, so bear with me. Um, I'm excited, as I said, I'm happy to be here to share a little bit of the background uh, of my work. Um, as Johanna uh, mentioned, um, I've been in the food industry for a very long time as a food journalist. It started 40 years ago um, when I was a young reporter for the Los Angeles Times and I had a theory. Um, I only had the women in my community uh, in Los Angeles um, and their southwestern food way, uh, foodways as examples, um, but I kept believing that there was a need to break the stereotype associated with African American women who had cooked in America's kitchens. Um, up to the work of Dr. Harris, primarily African American women had been portrayed as illiterate or as natural born geniuses, which couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, I wanted to direct my work and my career so that we could see these people as individuals who could inspire pride in the next generation and to help them increase their interest in careers that are associated with the food industry. I thought if we could find real women um, to talk about as opposed to women known as the plantation mammy or Aunt Jemima, the trademark uh, baking product, that young people would discover that uh, we had ancestors who had used food as a mechanism for their independence, for their freedom, and for their financial stability. It was a vision that stayed with me a long time, af even after I left my job as a newspaper food editor to raise a family. And it resulted in the book that Johanna mentioned, The Jemima Code, um, a book that tells the stories of these skilled and knowledgeable and creative black cooks. I used their cookbooks as evidence of their existence. I knew that this was the kind of subject ordinarily researched and recorded by scholars or experts born of the South. And I was neither academic nor Southern but guided by the Old Testament scripture from Proverbs 13:17, a reliable reporter is a healing presence, I decided to stay in my own lane. I relied upon journalism traditions to help me secure a contract with a New York literary agency, and the concept we created was to design a book that used cookbooks as its primary source to prove my theory of black culinary excellence. I began looking for any reference at all to the foods African Americans had prepared and eaten throughout history. I obtained a courtesy borrower's card from the University of Texas libraries, and this gave me access to obscure book titles and cookbooks through interlibrary loan. However, uh, as I became a student of Southern studies, women's studies, African, Africana studies, um, I read dozens and dozens of books by well-known scholars and historians, and I read interviews recorded by formerly enslaved people during the 1930s. I also obtained and began to observe 
um, practices through black cookbooks, but the problem was the books were always limited to um, special collections, library archives, and I couldn't always see them because they could be located anywhere in the country. That led me to start pu purchasing the books on eBay and anywhere I could find them. And before I knew it, I had rescued more than 375 rare black cookbooks that date all the way back to 1827. We don't often talk about people who were publishing of African descent in 1827, but the first author was the uh, first book published by a black person of any kind in this country and it was a household manager's book. What I discovered was people who were managing their kitchens wisely and who cooked proficiently and not by natural instinct as history had portrayed them, but through the kinds of handed down oral traditions that Johanna's exhibit helps us understand. I unfortunately lost that contract and no other publisher was interested in this material at least not until social media, and I was able to take this project to the internet. I started with a West African rite of passage practice called Sande, and I turned this material into a blog that I called the Jemima Code. At the same time, I founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization to try and figure out a way to use these role, these role models that I had learned so much about to inspire the next generation. I named that organization the Sande Youth Project. Within the first six months, the University of Texas came along and supported both my project and my book and agreed to publish the most beautiful uh, coffee table book um, that we have seen in a really long time associated with African American cooking. And I'm very proud of the fact that it was so well received, not for me personally, but for the lives that it has um, touched and the students and young people that have been inspired by this content. So I'm looking forward to learning more about what Johanna will share with you through future exhibits and what else we can learn today. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I, yeah, it's afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you to the center, Johanna. You're doing God's work. Um, I am the academic, if you will. I am recently retired after 50 years of teaching at Queens College CUNY in New York. And as the academic, one of the things that has been interesting is watching the development of a field. I am I'm the elder in the room, which is something it pains me to say, but I guess it beats the alternative. And as the elder in the room, I can say that I was around when the field of black studies was the nascent field. So that I am now watching food studies come along in some of the same kind of path. That being said, um, Johanna was a very good moderator and sent us some questions to respond to. And I basically took the questions and will respond. So the first question was, in an era of TV culinary celebrities and commercialized eateries, can you speak about the significance of everyday home cooking? So it is interesting but not surprising that the nascent area of food studies has become a much lauded academic discipline. Food, and by this I mean the everyday meals that keep us all going, are a vital part of food, is a vital part of the human condition. That is to remind us that without it, we die. It's real simple. So the thing that happens is no matter how much money, no matter where or when, Food is essential to human survival, and the main way that food has been delivered up until the recent era of fast food and fresh direct has been through home-cooked meals. These are the bedrock of most, not to say all, of the world's culinary cultures. That home-cooked meal is the linchpin. It's the centerpiece. It is what, what we need, what we crave, what we do 
and interestingly, who we are. As a result of that, I've sort of coined, I don't know if it's mine or if I've sort of glommed it from somewhere, a phrase, the history is on the plate. You can tell who people are by what's on the plate, by what's on the plate and sometimes by what's not on the plate. If you take a culture and look at its plate at any point in its history, you can begin to see how that history came together. So that the significance of the home-cooked meal is cardinal and cannot be overstated. Even when talking about kitchens that had traditions of palace cuisine or haute cuisine, if you talk about the culinary traditions of Morocco, it had a palace cuisine as opposed to adjacent Tunisia, which did not. It made for very different trajectory in terms of how we perceive those cuisines today. But it was the home-cooked meals that sustained those, even those preparing the palace food. I have stated largely, loudly, and publicly that long before we started talking about haute cuisine, and even when we start talking about Escoffier and his ilk, when Escoffier went home, he probably expected his wife to have dinner on the table. <laughs> and that brings me to Johanna's second question, which was about gendered food. Eons ago, I wrote an article called Mistress of the Stew Pot, Masters of the Flame. Okay, think about it. Mistress of the stew pot, masters of the flame. Women are essentially Hestia, they guard the hearth. They are mistresses of the stew pot. They deal with long, low, slow, and slow cooked in some cases food. Okay? Um, this gendered cooking seems to exist, and you know, I'm talking in gross generalities, which means any one of you can stand up and say, no, that's not how it is. Um, but in general compass, those are the conditions that prevail in African American life, or that did. Mistress of the stew pot, masters of the flame. Um, but some of those conditions changed as a result of those changes wrought by the slave trade. But in general compass, men do not cook on the African continent, except professionally or as a hobby. Now, last night I had dinner with Johanna, and she was speaking to the experience of her father here present and said that he cooked. I remarked, oh, interesting. He probably learned to do that as a student. For many African men, and this is again general compass, the ability to cook was something that came with leaving home. Because at home, the conditions that prevail socially in many households, no matter how modest the income may be, means that someone is there to prepare the meals. It is usually not a male. Or if it is a male, it is a family member of some sort who is preparing the meals in exchange for something. But that to say that this whole notion of gendered cooking does come with it. But we get this whole idea of women as home cooks, women perhaps as professional cooks, but that sort of stew pot, if you will, cooking. When we think of African American males in this country particularly, as a friend of mine used to call it, the United Statesian traditions, as opposed to the American, which extend to the hemisphere, we think of flame, cooking over what is called by the Culinary Institute of America, live fire. It's that relationship with the flame. It's barbecue. It's all of that flame cooking. So we get those things. Um, in terms of my books, this gendered relationship to cooking is evident. The fact that most of the recipes that I've documented and produced came from women informants, with some notable exceptions. In the welcome table, African American heritage cooking, I speak about my uncle Greg, who actually was a musician. He was a cabaret musician, 
but he loved to cook, and so he would cook. He lived in Puerto Rico and created his whole sort of Afro-American Puerto Rican meals in his house there. It may have had to do with the fact that his wife was Danish, and she had different culinary tradition from his own, and the only way he could replicate the dishes of his childhood was to cook them himself. Um, my paternal uncles, John and Bill, were professional cooks who actually brought younger members of their family north during the Great Migration as a result of their work. In my immediate family, my mother, however, was the cook very much according to the traditional gendered means. Um, my father couldn't cook a lick. I mean, nothing. My mother was a trained dietitian. Once a year, my father would venture into the kitchen to create something from leftover cake batter that he referred to as dip. It was the only thing he made. I have never seen a recipe for it, and I have never heard of anyone else who did it. It was sort of leftover cake batter and milk put together. And then you dip the cake in it, hence dip. Um, <laughs> How does the complexity and diversity of black food in America, past or present, come up in your work? Well, OK. Um, I've written 12 cookbooks and more articles than I want to think about. Um, it has to do with the gray hair thing. Um, about food of the African diaspora, I've written one specific, well, actually, two specific ones that refer to African American food, again, in the United States in terms. Uh, the Welcome Table, African American Heritage Cooking, and a book called The Kwanzaa Keepsake that deals with the African American tradition of Kwanzaa. Um, but I think one of the things that happens in terms of the diversity and complexity of food is we are only beginning now to think about food not only as gendered but in terms of class. And class in African American food, you know, it's it's the great unspoken. We are only beginning to be reasonably, and probably that's an overstatement, slightly comfortable in discussing race. Class trumps race in terms of the discomfort that it produces any day. And I'm sorry to have used that verb, apologies, please. But the point is the whole notion of how we deal with this complexity and this diversity of food is something we're still working on, something we have not yet really come to grips with. What does it mean to have been a middle class African American? What was the food of the talented 10th? What were the foods of free people of color as opposed to enslaved people of color, and how does that work? All of those things are things we're just beginning to scratch the surface of, and that's why it's so much fun to be a part of a nascent academic discipline. We have not even begun to talk about regionality. And one of the fun things for me in um, conceptualizing the cafeteria at the Smithsonian was to look at food of African Americans from a regional perspective. In, uh, I think it was about 2012, might have been 2011, I was asked by the Scholars Committee and NAMAC, which is the acronym because saying National Museum of African American History and Culture is a mouthful. So NAMAC um, had a Scholars Committee and the Scholars Committee was chaired by the late John Hope Franklin and it involved scholars in various disciplines from African American scholars for the most part from around the country, not to say the world. And I was invited to do a presentation on food. After I did the presentation, they asked me to work with them on the cafeteria. What happened as a result of that was I was given the mandate to look at food, but I also was in, you know, told, quite frankly, it's a Smithsonian, so we have to know what we're talking about. The Smithsonian Museum that at that point was the go-to museum for its cafeteria was the Museum of the American Indian. And what was very interesting about what they were doing was they had made food become part of the museum. 
it was organic. It grew from the exhibits themselves. Um, one of the things that I find about African American food is while it is many things, it is also at times improvisational. And the improvisation is what I like. I can't follow my own recipes as a cook. I have to read four recipes, decide what I'm going to do, look in the refrigerator, see if I can do it, and then I improvise. So the cafeteria became a jazz riff, if you will, on Mitzi Tom. Mitzi Tom being the cafeteria at the Museum of the American Indian. So I thought to myself, I did, I did. Um, hmm, we've got regions. They're not necessarily tribal. But if we look at regions, we begin to see a whole nother African American food. So I divided it into regions. The agricultural south, which would be the inland, upland south, the south of, uh, you know, where you sometimes hear da 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 in the background playing as you think of the plantations. That was my attempt at Gone with the Wind theme. <laughs> um, the agricultural south. You then have the Creole south or the coastal south, where the food is inflected by the foodstuffs that come from the coast. You get the cooking of Savannah, you get the cooking of Charleston, and you certainly get the cooking of New Orleans. The North, both the mythic North of enslavement, um, Robert Hayden, Runnegate, Runnegate, oh mythic North, oh yonder star-shaped Bible city. You were talking about the North in its mythic sense of freedom, escape, so on and so forth. Those of you who may have seen the film 12 Years a Slave, his wife was a caterer and a cook. So you have those relationships in the North as well. Um, you also have the geographical North. And then finally, in terms of the continental United States, the rest, the food of the Buffalo Soldiers, the food of Mammy Pleasant, who hate being called Mammy, but Mary Ellen Pleasant, who was a boarding house runner, ru ran a boarding house, sorry, and was the mother of civil rights in San Francisco. Um, Abby Fisher, out of California, all of those people in the West who are unfortunately often ignored, as well as a station that's not yet there because we ran into space difficulties called Culinary Cousins. And Culinary Cousins was a station that was designed to talk about the relationships among the foods of the African diaspora. OK, there's one more question. Oh, actually, there are two more. I am over talking. I'm sorry. OK. Um, and it was about, as writers and scholars who publish cookbooks, can you talk about the relationship between written recipes and longstanding oral traditions common to African diasporic tradition? Do you view the work as a firm, form of preservation or something else entirely? Well, my thing would be the whole idea of oral tradition. In general compass, again, those horrific generalities, um, if people of the Jewish faith refer to themselves as people of the book, African Americans and Africans in general compass are people of the word. We like words. We play with words. We enjoy someone who is well spoken. In Senegal, there is actually a role in some of the traditional Wolof courts of the Birknek. The Birknek is the one who can play with words, the one who knows how to speak using proverbs, the one who can. It's the rhetoric. It's the righteous rhetoric of an African-American minister. It is that cadence. It is that love of language. It is that love of speech that you hear in the speeches of Martin Luther King and in the speeches of Malcolm X. It's that love of the word. So orality is important. It's important, and it is often disregarded because people go, oh, it's not accurate. It's accurate. Um, example that comes from something that might seem to be a non sequitur, um, but that is Yoruba religious tradition in the hemisphere. 
I have the great good fortune to be a real witch, if you will. I am the first American to be initiated into the oldest house of Candomblé in Salvador de Bahia de Todos Santos, Brazil. And in the course of that trajectory, which we definitely don't have time to get into today, I started out with people who were out of the Santeria tradition in Cuba and then migrated to the Brazilian tradition and at one point got them all together for a ceremony. The thing that was astounding to me, I mean brings tears to the eyes, is that at one point a drumbeat was started. The people from the Cuban tradition who were African Americans in New York City and the people in the Brazilian tradition sang the same archaic Yoruba words to the same rhythms, to the same song. They'd never met each other. They didn't know each other. They knew their respective traditions through oral history. Tell me it's not accurate. It was a powerful moment. And in that same way, recipes have been maintained orally. Family traditions have been maintained orally. And the final question, and I will shut up now, can you speak to the ways temporality impacts the work that you do? My response is simply, it's food. We all know where it's heading if everything is in working order. <laughs> it ill behooves us to attempt to fix something that is in and of its nature temporary. The best thing that we can do is attempt to recover, revalorize, present, and honor history. Thank you. I want to thank you both. That was amazing. I think before I open it to Q&A, I would love to, I love hearing you talk about the oral traditions and thinking about your work, uh, Ms. Tipton Martin, and collecting cookbooks. I would love to hear your thoughts on the role of oral uh, traditions. Sure. So for me, uh, the cookbooks are an expression of oral tradition, right? Um, women classically have been known as the provider, the creators of cookbooks um, as far back as cookbooks in America existed. There was a tradition of cooking and cookbooks in, in European cultures, but they were primarily produced by doctors who were trying to help ensure that people did not die from the foods that they were cooking. They didn't poison anyone. But when Amelia Simmons created the first American cookbook in the late 1700s, um, she interpreted American indigenous ingredients with, um, with European recipes and practices. So African Americans come along in that process and are in the same situation. As Africans, they came to this country with their own knowledge base and memory dishes. And we all understand that the plantation mistress may have read a book and a recipe to her African cook, but I like to say that she did that only once. And then she went back to her social life, and the kitchen was a dirty, hot place. She certainly did not exist in there. And so what happened? The questions I asked were things like, what happened with that dish and that recipe? Because there was no tradition of recording the African's presence in that creation of that dish. And through Dr. Harris's work and other um, anthropological studies, we can see that if an African understood that you stirred the stew pot from left to right, and she came to this country and was instructed to stir it from right to left, when the mistress left the presence of this cook and the, mis the cook stirred it in her traditional manner, that dish became her own. It's, it's protected by copyright law. She changed the methodology for that dish. But she's never been given credit for that. And as a result, the cookbooks became an important, valuable resource 
of the recording of that history, even through the white women's cookbooks. Because what we can see is that there are practices that white women did not, they just simply did not do them. They have African strands within them. And so the cookbook process is a way of validating the various other resources that we use to substantiate a presence or a philosophy or a way of being. And it, it validates the oral history in a way that, as Jessica said previously, um, the, the academy hasn't necessarily respected oral tradition. But if we look at those 1936 WPA interviews against various other um, written traditions, whether they're song lyrics or recipes or historical documents, diaries written by these white women, we're able to see a through line. The oral history becomes the proof, in my opinion. And so it is, it is as essential, if not more essential, than all of the other elements that we have previously afforded so much um, so much weight, too. So oral tradition is everything to me. OK, I think we can have a few questions. There are two microphones on each side of the aisle. If anyone would like to ask a question, great. Hi. Um, I would like to just ask your opinions about um, this categorization of some of the Southern cuisine as slave food and the, um, what I've seen in recent years is maybe a rejection of some of those traditions. I'm thinking like chitlins or other kinds of um, uh, dishes that people are um, rejecting as you know uh, part of the part of the, the the cape of enslavement and wanting to um, you know shame that as maybe a class issue or, or some, something something that kind of separates uh, from certain culinary traditions and just wanted to hear your opinion about that or as a way to reclaim it or to, to bring dignity to those dishes. Well, I think one of the things that's, that's interesting and one of the things that is equally problematic, and remember I talked about class, remember I talked about race, African Americans, ironically, but and perhaps unfortunately, we are the only people in this country who demonize our own food. Okay? It has to do with all sorts of thorny issues, not the least thorny of which is enslavement, but the whole notion or the whole ignoring of the fact that these are the foods that brought us across is something that we haven't yet general compass, and again, I am speaking in horrific generalizations now, in general compass, we have not come to grips with this yet. Um, we are not the only people to eat chitlins. They put them in a sausage casing, deep fry them, and or serve them cold in France and call them andouille or andouillette. All you have to do is go to the Brasserie Lip on the Boulevard Saint-Germain in Paris, sit next to somebody who's having them, you get a waft of that chitlin and it will take you straight home, okay? They are eating the same things without the demonization. Um, we now have this whole nose to tail thing that's going on with food. It's a very complex issue. I think in some cases we are beginning to look at it. People like Michael Twitty with the book, The Cooking Gene. Um, some of the other people, particularly online, are beginning to say, let's look at this. Let's, let's take a dive into what these things come out of. In some ways, we are um, just beginning to scratch the surface of that. But ironically, we are some of the very few people, and it is not just African Americans which make, or, or let's put it this way, it is not just Afro United Statesians. It is in some cases, not all, in some cases hemispheric, particularly in the English speaking parts of the hemisphere where people demonize. I did uh, 12 years consulting in Barbados 
and had any number of young chefs coming back from culinary schools in the States go, oh, that's not my food. I don't eat, you know, cuckoo. I eat foie gras. It's, it's part of our coming to grips with our history and the thorniness thereof. And if I could just add to that, um, Dr. Harris spoke earlier about um, our failure as yet to address class. And one of the um, important things to come out of the study of the cookbooks in the Jemima Code is that it, those books reveal another level of African American cooking. Right, so when it comes to African Americans, as I spoke a minute ago about copyright, we also are the only people in this country that have not been given credit for the food that we cooked while at work. And I like to say that we don't know what Emeril Lagasse cooks when he's at home with his family. He is recognized as a celebrity chef for the food that he prepares when the resources permit when he is at work. And if we are going to apply that same standard to African American cooking, then it would mean that there is another class of food for us. It does not have to mean we are rejecting soul, southern, survival. We want to respect all of those as categories of accomplishment and achievement for our ancestry. But we also have to give credit now to those people like uh, Duchess Comino who lived here or Thomas downing the caterer. There are so many people who were not responsible for the agricultural aspects of the food, but for the intellectual aspects of it, if you will. They, they were classically trained chefs who worked in the plantation kitchen, whether that was at uh, Monticello or working for George Washington. There were women who made their living as vendors who were considered the best bakers from here to Savannah. And we have not yet recognized that those are our foods as well. Um, as Dr. Harris said, there are some very thorny, difficult things for us to talk about when we think about African American food. And I might be in trouble here by saying this, but um, we may be, it may be almost impossible for us to disentangle our food from the mainstream culture's food because we are the only people that did not come here as immigrants. And so we were forbidden to demonstrate our prowess in the kitchen or anything that was cultural. We had to embed that in what we were doing. And as a result, the broader community was able to take that, appropriate that, create industry out of it, make businesses out of it, and our food ways have been lost. And so lastly, I'll say that the reason I gave that explanation of who I am and where I've come from, it is because the foods of the West, prior to what um, has been done at the Smithsonian, were not considered part of the African-American canon. So I would just say that it is unfortunate that as a people we are going through that self-loathing process, but I think that it's part of a greater opportunity that we are all having now um, to explore the different aspects of what makes us African-American, and that's what we're going to have to live with. We won't be able to draw a through line as the Italian-American or the German-American, so the African-American. There is a break, and enslavement did that to us. Um, so scholars, we're all just putting together as many pieces as we can, and this exhibit is an example of that, to try and align broader experiences than what was uh, limited to Southern and Seoul food. And lastly, Jubilee is going to address that. Hi, um, so first, thanks for taking the time for giving the talk. And also, apologies, is this question still percol percolating a little bit? But building off of the question and the idea of um, a demonization of cooking, and also the James Beard Awards, the excellence in um, in cuisine that you found doing uh, the, your research, and Johanna's question about um, the uh, the commercialization and competition of cooking. Did you find yourself at all 
inclined or resisting to comparing um, his recipes or the cuisine uh, to standards that might not be originating or stemming from the African American community, um, such as you know standards that might not be um, you know accepted or, or developed by the community and be seen as um, pushed from the outside, or was there any difficulty with um, you know deciding what makes a great um, recipe or what makes a great um, plate to be included? Um, well, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, so in the creation of Jubilee, um, which is an expression for freedom um, in the Jewish culture, in African enslaved history, um, it was so carefully chosen to say that we now, that through Dr. Harris's work and other more contemporary work and the, Ju the Jemima Code as our another form of evidence for us, we are no longer, in my opinion, um, uh, required to see through that European lens. Um, we're able to see that Africans, African Americans have had multiple culinary experiences in this country. And the through line through the recipes in Jubilee is that I, was ta I took a select number of recipes chosen from a source and followed them throughout our culinary history. That's what reporters do, right? We have to find the facts. And um, so it removed that personal agenda that I had, which was to find a place for myself in African American food history. Um, I've spent the better part of my uh, career um, with a loss of identity. Because when you are in this field, most people refer to this work as exclusively African, diasporic, or soul. And there wasn't a place for me or for what you're describing. That would be considered white food, right? Um, and I've had people ask me that generally now about Jubilee. Well, what kind of recipes are black recipes? You know, is, isn't that white food? And again, I refer back to Emerald. What they created on the job is theirs. We cannot assume that a train chef on the Pullman Railroad who took asparagus home as the leftovers in the same way that a domestic in the South who took home green beans. They both took that home and made do with it, as the language we use. They applied the techniques that they had been working with all day or the resources they had. And so in the agricultural South, that might mean green beans and new potatoes and a piece of fat bag. It is unfair for us to assume that this northern Chicago chef treated the dish the same way. If he's been making hollandaise all day and all you need is lemon and butter and flour, it is fair to believe that he cooked that at home. Oral histories will help us because we can talk to the generations of children, as I have done, who have said, if, my, if I never eat another piece of asparagus again, I will be thrilled because her father was a trained chef and they ate asparagus all the time. But my initial publisher asked me, do black people eat lamb? Do black people eat asparagus? What would be growing in an African American garden? You know, these are, everything has been seen through an exclusively European lens and what we're all hoping to do with this work is allow it to stand on its own to the extent that it can. to the end of the forum. I want to really thank Dr. Harris and Ms. Tipton Martin for just sharing so much of their work with us today. And I also want to thank you all for being here um, and joining us. And feel free to check out the exhibit. There is a catalog, video, a lovely herb garden, and I hope you enjoy your commencement weekend.